Telecast. Don't forget you can listen to the full version of this week's show at telecast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Joe? Alan? <laughs> Guest on account of the cakes. I wasn't sure how many to bring. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. Oh, oh hello. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. <laughs> oh, we can always take a moment if nobody comes. <laughs> we'll give it 20 minutes. to come in then. We all look knackered. That's because we are. <laughs> so Patrick, tell us about how this series came about then. You know, where's the gestation process of Mr. Bates versus the Prosa? When did that start? 2020, a brilliant factual producer called Natasha Bondi and her colleague Ben Gale from Little Gem um, had been working, I think, for about six months on um, what probably started as an idea for a documentary, but they very quickly realised, no, this would work better as a drama, a story that they had been out there for a while, as we all know, but no one had really paid attention to, and they did. And they went out and they uh, talked to Nick Wallace, the journalist, who whose podcast was soon to come out. They talked to Alan Bates. Nick immediately pointed them to Alan they discovered Alan Bates and his role in the story and they went to meet him and they met Joe and they Joe Hamilton and all of the characters that you got to know in the drama, they went to meet, except obviously the post office execs who remain in hiding. And she built relationships with them. She built trust with them. She, uh, she got them kind of all on side and said, would you like a drama made? And they went, yeah, because no one's paying any attention. Um, and she, and I was lucky enough that, we were the door that she walked through and said, I've got something, do you want to, are you interested? And I'd never heard of the story to my shame. And I'm one of many people who had never heard of the story. Never. So there was never a documentary made? Absolutely if... there was. It was all out there. And and she handed me this kind of um, pitch document. She sent it by email. Ben, I think Ben and Natasha sent it together. I could, do you know what? I can't quite remember. All I remember is reading it for the first time and going, this is this is made up, right? This can't be real or it's exaggerated. And I went online and I realized it's not at all, it's real. And I phoned them up and said, oh my God, this is amazing. Let's, I'd love to work with you on this. So we teamed up and formed a gang and um, they brought their factual expertise and their relationships and we um, made the show with them. And do you think the show's worked because of that factual expertise? In terms, I mean, we, there's lots of reasons why I have amazing performances, amazing script, et cetera. Um, and it looks fantastic. But that's the amazing thing to me is the, the factual aspect of this drama really tells this, this remarkable story. I mean, how, how do you see it? Well, uh, that's about the 10th factual drama I've worked on. So I, have a, I had a team at ITV Studios, I think it's one of the reasons they came to us, who have a track record in making factual drama. So that helped, I think, for us to be the ones that were offered the first choice. Um, when, you, when you make a factual drama for a, a broadcaster in this country, you, you've got one of three uh, tags that can begin the show. It can either say inspired by, which means, as far as I know, I've, um, you know you've, you've used the name of the character and maybe the right city and basically made up the rest. And or you can use, you can get based on a true story. And that means you have to jump very high hurdles 
to qualify for based on a true story. That means that, you know, it needs to be as close to a true story as you can reasonably make it. But presumably there are some bits that have been invented, but still in the spirit of the true story. And it needs to be signed off on by compliance and it needs to feel fair and representative of what actually happened. Okay. And you, you'll often see that uh, some of these characters or, yep. or situations are, are, you know, yep. are made up and it's very clear that that's... that's but okay. based on a true story is what most dramas get. And then there is, this is a true story. And very, very few dramas qualify for that. And we did, and others have done it, but we did. And there's a reason for that. And that is that not only had Natasha and Ben already done a lot of research, but then when we got our hands on the material, we went off and did another year and a half before we even started developing the script. And we did that partly on our own. And a brilliant executive called Joe Williams um, uh, wrote a hundred and thirty thousand word research document it's a book um, of all the stuff that we learned along the way as we researched what had happened and why it had happened and how horizon worked and what the post office had done and the timelines and all of that stuff and then we approached uh Gwyn hughes the writer and said will you come and work with us on this and she did know a bit about the story and she said wow that's a lot of work and that's a lot of time and it's covid lockdown and it's this is complicated stuff it's the second lockdown i think but we presented her with the book and she went, wow, okay, you've done a lot of work. And that allowed her to see what the story was as she chose, she, she made those decisions. Alan was obviously the first and most obvious decision being the protagonist. And then she herself then did the same thing again. She got on trains and she got on her car and, and she went and saw all of those people and spent days and days with them, talking to them and getting to know them so that she could honor their suffering and their stories properly and that meant that when it came time to write the script it was essentially a true story everything that you see happened i mean literally everything and we could stand it up from three or four different angles and that's down to the quotations as well right quote i mean obviously there was uh, i think it was the select committee hearing one word part. word for word yeah yeah we had to and the the post office are so litigious and so unhelpful and so ghastly I use those words wisely, but I really feel that, that we were determined to offer them no opportunity to stand us down, no opportunity to stop us from transmitting. So we simply used the facts as they existed. Every word that Paula Vanells spoke in the drama was taken for emails that she'd written or uh, minutes of meetings, despite their attempts to redact every document that we got our hands on. Um, and we, it's just all true. Everything you see is true, which is why our compliance team at the end went, you get to call yourself a true story. And, and I think that's just testament to Joe and Immy and Natasha and Gwyn um, for the lengths they went to tell the story as it happened. Because the facts are so ghastly that they don't need to be made up. Yeah. It's that journalistic rigour, back to the point Massive. about being factual drama. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, and, it's really... And, and Gwyn came from a journalistic background and Joe, in another life, Joe should have been a journalist. And it was that appetite. And I have to say, I love journalism as well. Um, it's that appetite to tell it like it is that I think the world kind of responded to. I think they could sense that it was real. And also people did come after us and try and kind of poke at the story and figure out if it was true. And very quickly they discovered it was. So, you know, we didn't get everything right, but we did get the facts right yeah um, and just it i think it's there's a, a general sense of exasperation or disbelief really that this whole investigation or the process that uh mr bates and all, all the rest of the uh, sub postmasters that were wrongly accused and uh and charged this is going on for 20 years and we know tragically some people have taken their lives some people have passed away some people never have never seen justice and there was really only computer weekly and private eye that picked up early and were campaigning on this and it was it was just almost in plain sight wasn't it i think everybody i certainly was aware of it i'd heard the odd piece on radio 4 today every 6 months or so and it's like oh that thing's still going on but it really took your drama to completely shift the narrative and move things forward, which is, 
which is fascinating, even though there's an inquiry still going on, isn't there, right now? There is, and let's hope more truths come out. You're absolutely right about Private Eye and uh, Computer Weekly, those brilliant journalists on both. I think it's also worth a shout out to Nick Wallace, who came in relatively early and was reporting on it for a while and then did the seminal um, podcast, which we really were inspired by, and he became a consultant on our show. I think it's also worth talking about James Arbuthnot, the MP played by Alex Jennings in the show, um, who was there talking in government all the way through, shouting about it, saying, come on, guys, help me here. Something terrible has happened. He was joined later, I think, by Kevin Jones. So there are real heroes in this story who were, you know, beating their drums and telling people what had been going on for years. And, and they deserve a lot of respect because yeah. they never stopped. I, when I went to meet James Arbuthnot, I, I won't deny feeling a shred of apprehension because I'm shred of apprehension, whatever the right expression is. I'm, I'm not a Tory and I was not expecting to like a Tory MP and, um, and I'm in awe of him. I'm, I, I was completely mesmerized by him and blown away by how much he cared and how hard he'd worked and how angry he was and how determined he was. And it really helps to inspire us and give us kind of, um, you know, there are times we worked on this show for three and a half years. There are times when you definitely think, is it worth it? And people like James Arbuthnot were the ones who made us go, we have to keep going. He's been doing it for 15 years. We've only been doing it for three. <laughs> and uh, he just showed that there are some really good MPs out there. And there's actually a line, isn't there? Uh, I, I think it was something like, you know, I never expected to like a Tory MP. There's actually a line in the drama, isn't there? Some I think we all, I think, you know, a, a lot of people who work in drama are probably more left wing than right. And, and I think people like James Arbuthnot would appear to be the sort of people that we'd normally go after, not him. He's amazing. So let's talk about the outcomes and uh, the reaction, first of all. Well, or even maybe let's take a step before that. What were the expectations on the eve of transmission? Because uh, obviously this came out on ITVX and also on the, uh, uh, on the linear channel. What, what were the expectations of the team as you were running up to the first TX? Well, let's go one step further back, actually. Let's go to the point where we've been working on the show for two years. We've been in conversations with ITV Network about it. And uh, Polly Hill, I had pitched it to as an as a drama. Um, and she said, immediately, I want that. That's amazing. We should be telling that story. She's always on the lookout for, for true stories that are not crime. I mean, obviously, this is a crime, but not, you know, murder, true stories. She got very worked up about it as well when she read the research. So we were working on it, but we hadn't delivered a script to her. And then Nick's podcast came out and then the, I think I'm getting my timeline right, and then the uh, court cases happened and the Court of Appeals. And as soon as that happened, a lot of other producers started to get a sense of this story and started to phone up the sub postmasters to say, hey, can we tell your story? And we didn't own them. You can't option the life rights of 750 people we'd persuaded them all that we were a good thing we'd shown them that that we were working hard on the project but there was nothing to stop them going with somebody else if they felt they had a a kind of a faster route to a green light frankly and there was every possibility that other broadcasters would commission a, a show or a script or whatever and we turned to polly and we said we are three months away from giving you a script and there's a fear that we might lose this so Polly looked at how hard we'd worked and knew that the writer was Gwyn Hughes and she greenlit it without a script. And that in my world is pretty unheard of. And that's bravery and commitment. And that's because from day one, I think she saw that this was a story that her audience, their audience would respond to. If I'm being honest, I, I'm not sure I did. It's not that I didn't. It's that I don't know. Who knows? And... Um, and that all I knew was that I, we all wanted, I think I speak for the team when I say our stated intent was we wanted the, the sub postmasters to feel heard. There's not a number of viewers in that statement. There's not a number of newspaper articles. There's not a social action. There's not anything other than we wanted them to feel like we might, God, in our dreams, be part of lessening their sense of shame and and trying to help their sense of healing 
And even that, as I said out loud, sounds um, pompous and, and naive. And, but that was what we were trying to do, was allow them to feel heard because it felt like they hadn't been. So that's all we hoped for. And Polly, all the way through, kept saying, I think this is going to be a hit. And then when she saw it, she said, this is definitely going to be a hit. I didn't know that. I've worked on shows that I was pretty convinced would be a hit that weren't. And I've worked on shows that I wasn't sure have turned into big hits. And on the morning of transmission, if I'm being honest, I wrote an email to my team saying, we're up against The Tourist on Monday and Tuesday. We're up against the second season of The Tourist, which is a monster hit. Oh, the first season was a monster hit. We're up against the second season of Traitors. That's a monster hit on Wednesday and Thursday. All four episodes could be wiped out. And I said, when I call you in the morning, tomorrow morning, with the overnights, um, please don't be dismayed. Please trust in the idea that even if we get killed, which we probably will, this show is good enough and important enough and moving enough that it will find an audience, maybe over weeks, not days. But I think we'll find an audience and I think we'll do what we set out to do, which is to allow these sub postmasters to feel heard. I don't think any of us had any idea except Polly. And when she called up the next day and told me the overnights, I thought I'd misheard her. And, um, and she said, I told you, I told you. So... And got- what led to that then? What, what led to that success, do you think? Was it... I mean, in terms of the publicity, pre-programmed publicity, was that particularly, I don't remember it being particularly impactful. I just remember everybody suddenly talking about the show. And is there anything that you can pinpoint to to that success? Or is it just a story, do you think, that people just saw it on the listings and just thought, I want to watch that? I don't know the answer to that question. And if I did, I'd be a very rich man and, and, and everyone would be trying to replicate it. I don't know what made people choose that show that night. I know what made people choose that show for episode two and tell all their friends. I, I under, I, that much is easy. I still don't know why they chose us on the first night not knowing what the show was. Hmm. There was a very good trailer, which we were very careful to not present as an issue-led trailer. We agonised over it. We didn't want it to feel slight, but we also didn't want it to feel bleak and, and like homework, as we call it. The trailer portrayed the tone of the show quite accurately as something that, although about a big subject, it would feel enjoyable to watch. And we worked really hard on that. And for that, our shout out goes not just to Gwyn, but also to our brilliant director, James Strong, who manages to tread that line between making it hugely entertaining to watch and also so emotional. It's not until later you realize how angry you are and how moved you are. So I don't know why people chose it. I, I, I wish I did. And I, I, because there are shows that I've worked on that I think were really, really good that people chose not to watch, actively turned off, but sorry, didn't turn on. I don't know, but I do know that once people started to watch it, we could tell from that first morning that word of mouth was incredible. Um, And you could just feel it. You could feel it on social media. You could feel it in the ether. You could feel it from the phone calls I was getting from friends who don't watch TV, calling out going, at last you've watched something I can watch. And you know, that sort of sense of, it, it was a breakout hit. I think we knew that pretty quickly. Yeah, and maybe that had something to do with Toby Jones as well, who's obviously, you know, beloved British actor. And I was talking about it earlier on, actually, in the, everything he appears in, he just brings that. Um, I don't know what it is. There's something that is very, very likable, believable, but also as a way of playing making unremarkable characters remarkable in a way. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's also worth talking about the rest of the cast as well because we couldn't go anywhere near affording them on our budgets. And we went down on bended knee and went to each of them and said, this is all we've got. Would you consider doing This is why we're doing this show. This is why we think it's important. Would you consider doing this for us? And they went, where do we sign? Every single, in, I think I'm right in saying for every single part, we got our first choice. And they all did it for a fraction of what they would normally earn um, to help get that story to the widest possible audience. So the only reasonable answer I can give to the question, why do people switch on, is I think when they watched the trailer, they saw a depth of 
talent and a depth of names that they recognised, there were about 12 of them where they went, oh, I know them, I know them, I know they're good, they're good. And they were all in the same show. And I think that must have helped. I don't know. What is it? How do you know what's going to be a hit? I don't Well, maybe we'll we get Polly is, Hill on one day. And, yeah, do. Uh, she, can, she can talk about... Um, She's a very yeah. smart exec. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to any of those questions. What I do know, I think, is what I've learned and partly because I think it's been explained and partly because we read it a lot on social media is I think, and heard it then later in the newspaper articles, is that I think what, obviously we didn't set out to do this, but I think over and above the story, the, the story of the sub postmasters, which in itself is so powerful and moving and monstrous, is I think what the show also did was it tapped into a larger national rage at feeling unheard by our politicians and those that lead our bigger companies. And, and it may be that the timing was just perfect, that we've, as a nation, we feel like we can't trust so many of the people that sit in government. And I don't mean them all, James Arbuthnot. I mean, there are, there are many James Arbuthnots, but there are many Boris Johnsons. And I think we can't trust so many people in government and we can't trust, it turns out, some of the people that run our companies. And that's a horrible feeling to realise you have. And I think this drama possibly tapped into that rage and it became the thing that a country gathered around to say enough already, enough, this has just got to stop. And they chose these sub postmasters because their suffering was so immense and the injustice was so great. And they chose it to be the moment where they all stood up as one and said, enough, just it, somebody's got to start being honest and fair and kind. And, 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 and I think that helped too. That, that helped grow the story into something that got the attention it did in the newspapers. And we've all been in that situation sort of raging against the machine, you know, when we're, your call is important to us and you're on a, uh, an answer machine or you're on hold for 20, 30 minutes and it never gets answered. There's also an aspect of that, isn't there? I think in the small person, you know, being, not being able to affect the technology and, and, and the weight and size of a major institution, it's, uh, it's, it's, it was quite frightening, actually, an element of certainly, you know, what it did to many, many people there. So let's let's have a talk about the outcomes then. Um, oh, and by the way, before we do, what, what, do you know any numbers off the top of your head in terms of what those overnights were and the streaming figures, just roughly? So the um, the overnights, I think, were about three point seven million. Which, in a world where you know half, sometimes only a third of people watch TV live, immediately allowed us to think, "Wow, that's a big number. That we could be looking at seven million here." Um, that's our first response. And, you know, if you'd asked me to predict before it went out, what will this show get? I might have said three and a half. I don't, I don't know. I, I was very apprehensive. I wanted more people to watch it, but I didn't know if they would. It's, it's horrible, frightening um, to work so long on something and care so much and hope that people will connect with it. I think we immediately thought, well, maybe we'll get to seven. I think by the end of the first week, the Consolidateds were about 10 I think I'm right saying 9 or 10 and I think now they're approaching 14 maybe higher they'll be the the plus 28s will come out at the end of the week and who knows what they'll be they're so enormous. this is the biggest UK TV drama hit for I mean it's decades isn't it it's a long time since there's been a, a a hit of this magnitude I don't I genuinely don't know the answer to that question I think when the uh, when the consolidateds come out after 28 days I'm sure there'll be statistics thrown around yeah okay well we'll we'll uh, keep our eye on that um so let's talk about the outcomes then and before the show we were traveling up uh in the lift and we were talking about um and I said to you you know, the outcome of this and the change that it's effective must be the dream for any TV producer, anybody who, who, who's producing either a factual show or a, a, a drama series, to actually achieve the change that, that this, this has achieved must be the absolute uh, pinnacle. So let's, let's talk about those political outcomes then. Can I, can I stop you and say, uh, I think... Um... I think we need to be very careful not to overstate 
the effect of the drama. And I think I think it's worth saying that what people were responding to was not the drama, they were responding to the true story. And I think, I, boy, as a producer, and I know the rest of the team feel this way, we feel immensely proud that we got the story out there. But I don't think the nation rose up as one and... Uh, to the extent that the Prime Minister had to change the law because of a television drama, I think they rose up as one and forced the Prime Minister to change the law because of the injustice in real life. And I think we were part of that, but I'd be very nervous if people felt that we were out there saying, yay, look what we did. I think it's look what the country saw um, in, in this story and wanted to do something about. And that's the beauty of national television and that's the beauty of terrestrial television is that if you put it there instead of on a streamer and you and everyone has to watch it all in the same week, then there's the chance of that happening. And sometimes it does. And in our case, we were lucky that it did. But I'd really hate it if we're about to get into a conversation where where I'm claiming that we changed the law. No, but the drama was the vehicle. The, dra the drama was the thing that passed the message and the people of this country were the people that brought about change. So let's, let's have a look at, at that change then. You, uh, you already mentioned Rishi Sunak has told the Commons that legislation would acquit all those convicted in the Horizon IT scandal. Post Office CEO Paula Venels has given back her CBE. Post Office Chairman has only a couple of days ago been asked to leave his role. There's probably lots of other things that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm well, not aware of. Well, let's bring Fujitsu into this, because if you'll notice, we couldn't really touch Fujitsu mm. uh, in the drama because their crisis management team and PR teams and lawyers and all of that were just smarter, frankly, than the post office. And we couldn't land a punch on them, really. We could mention their name, but we couldn't properly uh, lift, the, lift the rug and show what they've been doing or not doing or lies or whatever. But we could do that with the post office. We were able to get enough information and facts to be able to show that what the post office had done was abhorrent. Um, what's interesting is that the weight, the, the kind of wave of public horror and, and anger that was directed at both companies um, was such that Fujitsu, having only days before the drama came out, done nothing to show any humility, show any sense of responsibility, pay any money, take any uh, share of the blame. I'm assuming, I need to be careful with my words, that they probably thought they were getting away with it. And, and as soon as they saw what was coming, they stepped out in front of it before anyone had to drag them with the most mealy-mouthed, shallow apologies. They were clearly not felt. And you can hear in the sub postmasters kind of responses to that, that they didn't believe a word of it, but they're trying to come out and say, oh yeah, us too. But that was a big result, is that they they could see what was coming and if they didn't make the first move, they'd be dragged into the street kicking and screaming as well. So that was a big result, I think. 10,000 online articles were written about the post office scandal um, in the two weeks after uh, transmission. That's quite a lot, is my understanding. Jane Root, who was our guest last week, talked about, um, chose her story of the week was this scandal, but in the New York Times. Yeah. So it's travelled internationally. One question that I'm really looking forward in this whole scandal to being resolved is where the money went. And that's never answered, obviously, in the drama because the investigation's not good. But I think we're going to get to where the money went and, and how those machines were interfered with and what was the result of that so that's one thing that i think everybody's going to be waiting to you know to to see justice really be served when um when those things become clear but one of the questions i've got is this you talked about linear tv and public service broadcaster bringing this sort of show to the british public why itv and not the bbc for this series it's a good question. I think it could have been the BBC. I think the BBC are amazing. I'm um, hoping to work with the BBC again very soon. I love the BBC. I spent 15 years of my life there. But ITV do have a tradition of at least twice a year playing true stories, whether crime or not, to enormous audiences 
who lap them up um, and they put them at the heart of their schedule and they are a, a great place to work with. And I was working for ITV Studios and I had a very good relationship with Polly. So I took it to her first because I thought it would sit well there, but it could have been the BBC. If Polly had turned it down, we would have, we would have gone there. And surely this must give real hope to the PSBs in terms of drama, the future of drama on PSBs, because again, you know, the, the impact is, is unlike anything we've seen for a long time. Do you think that this will encourage further focus on dramas, on this type of drama? Oh, I think commissioners at the BBC and ITV and Channel 4 and Sky have been wanting these dramas for a long time and commissioning them for a long time. I don't think this will bring in a new golden age of factual dramas being made because they already are and audiences love them and commissioners love them and actors love them and writers love them. Everyone loves them. And, it, it, you know, we, we want to feel at times like we're telling the truth to people and getting up people's noses and trying to effect change. Um, so it's not a lack of commissioning appetite. It's always been there across the board. And, you know, God, look at the work the BBC have been doing recently, too. It's stunning. I think the problem is that they're mostly true stories tend to be told in three or four part lumps, four parters. And they are hard to sell internationally. So the problem is not will people commission them and offer a license fee on terrestrial television. The problem is that then we as producers have to find the rest of the money we need to make the budget. And 10 years ago, that budget might have been £1.3 million an hour to make the Mr Bates versus the post office. And now it's nearly twice that. But the license fee has stayed the same. So the gap between what a broadcaster can give you and what you need to make the show has doubled. And... And it's very scary for distributors to then say, well, we're going to give you twice as much money to make a show that's only four parts, that's very British, that doesn't involve a murder. It, they're very hard to finance. I don't think the numbers of commissions will go up. I just hope that it will give sucker to distributors to keep financing them because it's getting, it's getting to the point where we may lose the four part British drama if we're not careful. And certainly Mr. Bates versus the post office went through a period about three months before production where it nearly fell apart. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So it was very nearly cancelled. Um, Just in terms of funding, in yeah. terms of like... Pure funding, yeah. So let's talk about the international success then um, or the challenges of selling this internationally because it's a very British story. Is it being sold? Is it uh, any being... Uh, I mean, I'm sure you can't uh, announce any deals being done on, on the show, but... Yeah, we've sold it. By the time this show comes out, there will have been an announcement in America. I know it's uh, sold to Australia because it's playing on Seven, Channel Seven. And I believe it's sold to four or five other countries already and they're in conversations with several others. So I think it'll sell well, but, but you, we wouldn't have known that up front. And I certainly wouldn't have looked anyone in the eyes and said, this is going to sell like hotcakes um, everywhere in the world because it's going to be a big hit because... You, like I say, I keep saying, I don't know. I, you know, I have, I, I wish I could bottle the success that we had and repeat it somehow and f funnel that through into each project that you work on. But of course you can't, no one can. And anyone who pretends they know is lying or completely mistaken. So um, it's just, we just have to keep begging and persuading and cajoling and casting up projects to get them financed and those ten thousand articles on the back of the show TXing has no doubt helped those international sales and i'm sure it will do much more but maybe those international sales wouldn't have happened through the 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 show alone it's just based the the, the overall interest and amazing sort of media maelstrom that's happened on the back of it that's helped it sell yeah but like I say, I, I do want to repeat it one more time. I think it's the story that I think we made a great show. I'm incredibly proud of it. But I, I think it what people have responded to in this way with this intensity is the true story. If you sat opposite Joe Hamilton as the investigator whose real name we chose not to use because it would have been the only name that we used. Um... But there was this person who existed, whose name we knew, who, who spoke to Joe Hamilton 
as if she was a criminal. He spoke to her with menace and with self-righteousness and with certainty that she had stolen tens of thousands of pounds. And if you've met Joe Hamilton, you would know that she's not a criminal. 99 people out of 100 would sit there and go, you don't seem like a criminal to me. So I wonder before I accuse you of this level of theft and treat you this abhorrently, I wonder, could I just ask you some questions nicely to try and figure out what's happened here? I think most people would have done that. And I think what people are responding to is watching that play out with all of the sub postmasters. I just picked up on Joe because she's the character that everyone knows in the drama from the first episode and seeing the way that she was treated, but they were all treated like that and many far, far worse. Um, if you if you've met these people, you'd see that you don't become a sub postmaster to steal money. You become a sub postmaster because you want to serve your community and be at the heart of a community. And there's something so beautiful and British and um, wonderful about that. And they went after them in the most horrible way. So um, it's it's so sad and I and and angry making, and I think that's what people were responding to. So we've got another clip of Mr. Bates versus the post office. Let's take a look at that. Hello, how can I help? Oh, hi. Uh, it's Joe Hamilton here from South Warnborough. I'm trying to produce this week's cash account. And what's the problem? I know it's probably me because I'm really rubbish with technology, but I've declared my cash, I've declared my stock, I've done it all three times and I still can't get it to balance. I hate Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> and what does Horizon say? It says I've taken £2,032.67 more than I think I have. OK, redeclare your stock holding. So that'll automatically create a discrepancy, OK? It'll have inflated your cash holding, so now I want you to reverse that difference. Right, oh. So now, if you redeclare everything, it'll balance, OK? This is so helpful, thank you. Don't go away, stay with me till I've done it. Oh my God, it, it, it's, it's just doubled right in front of my eyes. Now, now it says I'm 4,000 pounds down. It'll sort itself out, these things do. In the meantime- well, I, I was only doing what you told me. In the meantime, you'll need to make good the loss. I haven't got that money and I don't know where it's gone. I'm sorry, you are responsible for balancing your account and making good any shortfalls. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. Don't forget you can hear the full interview on all the major podcast platforms. For more telecast video conversations with the international content industry's leading executives, just click on the subscribe button below.